Okay, everyone, welcome to the Public Square Weekly Edition. I'm Wayne Shepard here with Dave Zanotti, along with the team, Rob Walgate, Alan C. Duncan, Jeff Sanders, Melanie Elsie, and a very timely topic today, Dave, although we're going back to a guy who died in 1963. We're going to learn a lot, I think. Uh, now, now, fascinated as to why you consider this timely, because I felt so nervous about bringing this to the conversation. Really? This idea of, yeah, the subject of escapism. Yeah. I thought, is anybody going to get this? Well, I hear a lot of conversation these days on both ends of the extreme. I hear conversation about, all oh, you Christians are just a bunch of nationalists who want nothing less than a theocracy. And then I hear a lot of people saying, well, we're, 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 our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth, so let's not worry about things. So we get both ends of it, don't we? Uh, isn't that something? It, it is so characteristically misunderstood on one side. You Christians want to take over the world. Uh, and the other is, you Christians don't want anything to do with the world. Right. Yeah, I know. Right. So, so which, which side of this, or is there a side, or what does it mean hmm. to have a biblical approach on the question of the two kingdoms? Now, we could go back to Augustine and the question of the city of God and the city of man. We can go back um, to, to the Tower of Babel. We could go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the... Uh, um, the Israel's choice for a monarchy. There's so many different elements to what we're talking about today, but let me suggest that this program has been driven by listener input. Hmm. I've talked with a number of people in the last couple of weeks, and they seem to have a very similar concern, and they're hearing messages along the line of, it's too late for America. Mm Mm-hmm that there's praying people, there's thinking people, there's godly people, there's preaching people. None of these are bad people. And, and they're, they're coming back saying, we just don't think there's any hope that America could ever come back. It's, it's too late. And then the logical step that they then move from there uh, is, is therefore we have to adopt a formula that there is a kingdom in heaven and that there's a kingdom on earth and that our citizenship is in heaven. And therefore, what happens on earth, we really don't have any way of dealing with it, influencing it. We're kind of out of this one. It's, it's time to check out, if you will, on the kingdom of earth, and it's time to check into the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the conclusion of what we that. I mean, do you hear people doing yeah, the same thing? Yeah, a- absolutely. And if, they, if there was a button to be pushed, a rapture button, they would push it, right? <laughs> yeah, if their if their eschatology affords it, now's the time. Where's that button? Yeah, and if their eschatology doesn't, it it's it's just it. Well, I guess in any way, shape, or form, no matter where you're looking at it, I I think yeah. the term is escapism. Yeah, it's time to get out of this one into the next. This world's going to pass away anyway someday. So why are we worried too much about it? Right. So Rob, I see your hand in the air right from the start. Well, I know this conversation is happening and we hear people talk about it and it's happening in the United States. And I guess my question would be is if we would find Doc Brown and get in the DeLorean, what (laughs) other places in history would we go back to since 1776 in the United States where people would be asking these same questions or coming to the same conclusion that the time on here is done? Well, like, which ones are you thinking of, Rob? Like, give a couple examples. Well, I mean, the, the Civil War, obviously, I think, would sure. jump to everyone and the amount of mm-hmm. destruction that was done. I mean, yeah. even um, the World Wars, one and two. I'm thinking of the Atomic Age. Yeah, we were all afraid of being vaporized by the Soviet Union by nuclear weapons. You can go back a lot further than that. I mean, 536 A.D., most historians today say that that was the worst year in human history. How could we ever get out of that? Because there are plagues and, and the, the temperature of the earth dropped. And there, the 14th century was probably the worst century outside of the 20th century in terms of blood loss. Besides all the plagues and all the bad weather and everything, then you had, well, you had the bubonic plague. I mean, how do you top that? Was that as bad as COVID? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but how could we ever get a, it? can't get any worse than this. We should just retreat and give up. No, civilization went on and things did get better. Let's let's take a second and, and let's drop back to the, the first premise. Let's 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 look at it this way. And let's go ahead and I'm going to unbury the lead. We're not going to hold it out five seconds okay. or five right. segments. Let's just let's go ahead and put it right on the table. Good. Um Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of earth. Yes, 
the Bible teaches there are two kingdoms. I think anyone who reads the scriptures can see that. The question is, are there two realities? Or are there two kingdoms in one unified reality? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's basically the premise of where we're going to end up. Now, we're going to bring in some really good conversations about how you get to that position and, and what does this, the Bible say? And we've got a wonderful uh, reading from C.S. Lewis today, one of the anchor authors of the American Mission Library here at the American Mission Center, and, and that is going to really capstone this as well. But the, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, yes, we're clear that there's always been a concept of an eternal kingdom and an earthly kingdom. The question is, are those two completely exclusive, separate realities, or are they one? And maybe what we should do is right from the start, we should go to the book of Colossians. Um, Jeff, could could you go to chapter one for us? And I'm the guessing, one you're talking we, about the, yeah, if we start somewhere around the 14th verse and end up somewhere around the 17th verse, we're probably going to be right about on this one yeah. as to the question of, is there one unified reality? Okay, I think I found it. It starts uh, Colossians chapter one, verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of of the son of his love. He's taken of taken us out of the dark kingdom and put us into the kingdom of light, right? In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things are held together or hold together. Wow. Wow. That terminology, (laughs) in heaven and on earth, that is a constant language that comes up over and over again in the New Testament. In heaven and on earth. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm. What's the Great Commission say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. In other words, yes, there is a recognition that there is some place up there we call heaven, and there seems to be a whole set of rules and standards and realities up there. And some place down here we call earth, and there's rules and standards, etc. But God's in both places at the same time, same God, same plan, right? Same station. Right. S- seems to be the truth from what I can tell in the Bible. You have Jesus m- making this point uh, in another place as well. If you go to Mark 14, he's, he's about to be crucified, and he's standing before the high priests, and, and he says, they're, they're questioning him, are you the Christ, are you the Son of the Blessed One? And he says, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a reference to, to a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. Mm-hmm. This is an enthronement, kingship statement that Christ is making. That's why they accuse him of blasphemy right after he says it. He's saying, I'm that guy. I'm about to go sit on a throne. Now, now, Alan, that's good. But the escapist, who's a figure of speech, so to speak, because mm-hmm. you know I'm not accusing anyone of being an escapist. Uh, people talk about escapism a lot. But an escapist position would be, well, wait a second. But when he was before Pilate, he said, he was asked, are you a king? And, and he said, my kingdom is not of this earth. Yeah, it's so, not from this earth. It is. It doesn't derive its powers from this earth. That's true. Yeah. And would you suggest, Jeff, that the language of that text supports what you just said? I, I would stake my life on it, yes. So there's a difference, isn't it? Just because it reads one way in English isn't the full meaning uh, of what it really says in the depth yeah. of what Jesus was saying. Yes, the Bible didn't fall down from heaven in King James English. It came down. It was inspired in Hebrew and Greek. Well, now That's he's gonna, now he's gonna, now we're now he's gonna start a fight. Now, oh man! Or any other version for those of you that are yeah, wondering. There you go. Certainly. Yeah. But no. But back to the the Mark uh, passage. What's the way that that they will see Christ in enthroned in this? Some would argue that the crucifixion 
is the lifting up of of Christ, uh, the, then the resurrection. And these are things that happened on the physical earth. Yeah, they're all stages in the same event. God, uh, Christ is going to take possession as king over the earth. Over there, and the, yeah, it's, it's it's over the powers, the principalities, the, the demonic forces will be defeated, and and uh, but these are things that happen in real time and space. Mm-hmm. There's not two separate realities. To your point, Dave. And we're off and running on the public square here today. No bearing the lead, as Dave said. We'll get to see us, Lewis, on this coming up on the program. Here, you stick with us. The public square. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. One word title this week, escapism. And I think you know now what we're talking about here with the team at the public square, Dave. Okay, so let's settle this question. Um, Does God own this earth, this world, all of time and space reality as we understand it. Is it, does it belong to him? Has he ever turned the deed over to somebody else? Has it ever been forfeited? Hmm. It's always been his, yeah. always will be. Full authority. Psalm 24, 1. Ah, you got to go back to the Old Testament, right, Jeff? The I mean, earth this is, just... is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world, it's a different Hebrew word, Meaning the 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 world of inhabited human uh, yeah. the inhabited world the filled system. human beings yeah. the world and all that is in it. Mm-hmm. So it's not just the terra firma, not just the dirt under our feet, but the world that that is inhabited by human beings. All belongs to Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Okay, so this is both a Hebrew and Christian reality. This is yes. basic, mm-hmm. self evident, bedrock truth. This place belongs to God. Okay. Now, my next question is, and this really is what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to try to set up a, a bit of a, of a construct because part of the escapism is being driven by a sense of hopelessness. And the hopelessness comes from a sense of abandonment. In other words, it's kind of like um, on the willows there, we hung up our lyres for our captors there required of a song. And our tormentor's mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Mm-hmm. The idea that God has abandoned his people, and God has particularly abandoned his people in America. And there is no hope for America because God doesn't care about this space anymore. My question is, is there ever a place hmm. where we can find in any Bible history where God didn't care? about what was going on on earth. I can't find a verse. I, I have a couple of other questions. I, sure. So, I mean, you can't find what, a verse. We, what we find is God who is actively engaged. He's not only the owner, he's not an absentee landlord. <laughs> no, not at all. And he, he, We know he is love. So, if, if he was an absentee landlord, he would be indifferent. And we know oh. he's not that. We know because the opposite that. of love, the opposite of love is not hatred. The opposite of love is indifference. Yeah. And God is never found to be indifferent in the scriptures. Never. He's also involved. He's not just the opposite of indifferent. He's, he's involved. One of my favorite passages is Isaiah 40, where he has to remind us, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? And he goes through a litany of describing who he is and his direct, caring, compassionate involvement with us. I, I got two questions. Where are they getting this? The people who want to say, well, it's over for God is no longer concerned with America and for, forget about any kind of revival. Did they get some kind of special revelation from God? <laughs> It's because memo. I can't find anywhere in Scripture where God tells us to disengage from the world, to retreat, to give up, or where he's telling us Christians to, to give up. And I can't find any place in my life that is off limits to Jesus. 
You hear a lot of people Am I say missing something. You, well, you hear a lot of people say, "Well, you know what? America doesn't appear in the Bible prophecy, you know, biblical prophecy. Well, America's I not agree named, with right? That. So that that they they take yes, a lot of uh, they read into that yep. a lot. So so is South America, so is Africa, <laughs> right. so is uh, Central right. America. I don't you know, see I mean, Bolivia uh, in there. I know? don't see Germany in there. Do you see? I, I yeah. mean, uh, where's where's Hong Kong? But Help we've all heard the argument. Soviet we? Union. Yeah. Right. Oh, so uh, yeah, that's, I've heard that. Sure. That is a piece of the painting because there has been so much uh, focus on the nuances of the Old Testament prophecies merging into the book of Revelation mm-hmm. that some people take a great amount of pride, I might say, and forgive me, but in the fact that they've got it figured out, they've got kind of names, dates, and times. Yeah, they got their charts, don't they? <laughs> yeah. And and I, I mean, it's not for me to criticize the intent of their scholarship, and I'm not challenging anyone personally. I'm just suggesting that Jesus told his followers in the first chapter of the book of Acts that if you want to know all the details, you're asking the wrong question. You are to be my witnesses and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has fallen upon you and come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. We are not to get lost in the details. So to draw a conclusion on something that is not specific runs the risk of that other part of the book of Revelation that warns us to not add words Mm -hmm. Hmm. to what you're reading here right now. So I think you can, Wayne, get off the the cliff on eschatology, but the people who've been coming to me aren't there. They're very open and very sincere about their eschatology and willing to listen to all points of view, biblically speaking. Their fear is a sense of hopelessness based upon the idea that God is keeping score And America has fallen in its practical behaviors and its acceptance and tolerance of behaviors to such a degree in their lifetimes they have never seen, they could never have imagined that we would be doing the things we're doing, accepting the things we're accepting, paying for the things we're paying for, what we're doing to children, what we're doing to the unborn, that they they cannot find any reason to hope that a culture that is this deeply embedded in sin could ever come back to a place where God would want to bless this country because God's really ticked off at us. By their extension, they're saying, why waste our time trying? Yeah. By their extension, they're saying, what's the use of holding out hope? This place is done. Uh, And some of them believe that God has got a pent-up scoreboard that is about to be released All right, upon us. Others, I think, have just said, you can't be this corrupt as a culture and survive. Now, there's two schools of thought. One is that the wrath of God is coming and it's well-deserved. The other is we've done so much sinning that we can't escape the consequences of what's happened. And whether God chooses to to, to add any momentum to that is not really the issue because we're doomed by our own hands and they've given up hope. I just don't see how that changes what we're supposed to do. Right. I, I mean, that that may very well be the case. But we're supposed to still be salt and light to the culture that we're in. You know, what, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative nothing? is to retreat. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, the alternative is to focus completely on the kingdom of heaven, to bear witness to see people bring to salvation, but to give up all other conversation because you're just wasting your time. And it, it's, it's just, there's no way. The numbers, the odds, the momentum are against us. Uh, Pray that people will come to Jesus, witness to your salvation and to his resurrection and his atoning death and sacrifice. Talk about his coming and his return of the kingdom, but accept the reality that the kingdom of this earth is now so far gone that we could never be less sinful than we are today. Hmm. Yeah, I keep hearing this phrase, well, it could never, it will never, we are too far, it could who are they talking to? You know, uh, as, a, as a Christian, I, I believe that God is almighty, and I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. Don't we still believe that God can do things that we can't conceive of, that, that we can't imagine? They say, well, I can't imagine God. Well, of course you can't. <laughs> God can, yeah. though, yeah. right? Yeah. Just, uh, I wonder, I know you can't draw one-to-one correlations, but just as an example or or something to instruct us, how did the Jewish people in the Hebrew Scriptures uh, in the Old Testament uh, act when they were 
uh, captive by another nation. They they didn't stop working towards the good of that other culture, mm. did they? And they were in some very bad cultures, but they still they still tried to work towards positive aims within those cultures, right? I mean, yeah, you look at Daniel, you look at the three Hebrew young men, they were part of the court of the king, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar or, or Darius or whoever. They were still working for good, right? Yeah, the, yeah and the, the book of Esther lay, lays Certainly. this out as, as well. My perspective um, is more of one of hope uh, and, and, and expectation and anticipation of what God is going to accomplish because I've seen— too many people have had too many conversations with people who have come out of the darkness because yes, of yes. the influence of people in their life or someone who was faithful to share Christ with them. They didn't write off the culture. They didn't write it off the individual because the culture is so far gone. We, I think we, we, we abandon the Great Commission in some respects if we walk away from— um, uh, a tenacity of continuing to complete this race all the way to the end. Because Christ said he would be with us to the end, right? Let, let's come back to the original premise that, that a way of coping with this is to see the world in regards to two kingdoms and to put your focus on the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of earth, from and as, as Rob pointed out earlier, as, and uh, I could say this right, an American-centric, Amero-centric, how would we ever say it? In other words, America is the center of the universe and all it is that we see. Because things in America are so bad, so awful, we need to focus on heaven because America, first of all, was never designed to be heaven on earth, but it's not even going to get close. I mean, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. We're going fast. We're going over the cliff. We're going over mm-hmm. the edge. You better put your thoughts on the next kingdom because there's no hope left for the kingdom here. First principle is... Where's this coming from? I believe it's coming from looking at the world around us as Americans, because the people that have been talking to me are all been Americans. The next thing that comes forward is, therefore, what's the use of trying anymore? We've lost American culture. There is no longer a self-evident set of truths that we hold to and believe in. We are doomed to chaos and so being involved at all in the American system of government is a complete waste of space because we're too far gone. And, and, and this is, uh, I'm, this, these people have reached this conclusion and they hold it with grief, but they hold it deeply. Mm-hmm. Now, what do we say to them? Well, I certainly sympathize. I, yeah, I, I never dreamed that we would be here, but I'm not going to give up. And that point we'll pick up on in a moment as we continue this conversation on the Public Square. Glad you're with us this week. If you're new, the program is weekly. We have other versions as well. They're all online at thepublicsquare.com and on many radio stations as well. Just look for thepublicsquare.com. Well, I won't back down. I won't back down. You can't stand me up at the gates of hell. of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. You have a seat at the table, so to speak, with us here at the public square today. Dave Zanotti's here, Rob Walgate, Alan C. Duncan, Jeff Sanders, and Melody Elsie, and I'm Wayne Shepard, and let's jump right back into it, Dave. You know, Wayne, I had a concern about doing this broadcast that maybe we needed to get three um, highly esteemed world-class experts in on the conversation. And I really prayed about that. Um, And I thought, well, one is when we look at that situation, we go to our library at the American Mission Center. Mm -hmm. The seven anchor authors 
Um, and we start to say, these people have already answered a lot of these questions. What do they have to say? And so, um, interestingly enough, one of the people that brought the, some of these questions to the table was a person that had a, a, a number of family members and friends over the years that worked a lot with Francis Schaefer. And so uh, Francis Schaefer certainly spoke about this. In a minute, we're going to get to another anchor author in what C.S. Lewis had to say about this. But I want to also be as fair as I can to the people, that because we're not arguing with the dear friends who've brought their concerns mm-hmm. to us. I am convinced personally from listening to this now for over 40 years that we get confused in America because of the nature of the type of government that we have. As Americans, we are so used to voting that we vote on everything, and if we don't, we want to vote. Um, We have been raised in the understanding that we have the right, responsibility, power, or habit that we vote. And so Christians who can count look at the electoral results in America. They look at the fact that the country is so deeply divided They look at the trend lines that they pick up from media and pop culture. They look at the um, wherever someone keeps the scale of the balances of sinful behavior. They see that one's completely off the chart everywhere, in the church as well as in the culture. No one's claiming holiness here. We've just become such a lowly uh, outfit and when it, and and such an I might add such an uninformed outfit as well. They look at what's going on in, in education across the board. They look at the fact that nobody understands the Declaration, nobody understands the Constitution, and they just say, "How can a people designed to self-govern do anything but run this into a cliff?" And we're so far gone, we're going off the cliff. It, it and, and and there's just there's no way to turn this thing around. It's just too far gone. They're doing the math. And they're basing their conclusion on their understanding of the math. Now, okay, you all been doing public policy for 40 years at the American Policy Roundtable. Why haven't you given up? Because you probably know it's worse than everybody else. (laughs) And that's the question they ask us. In every commission I look at in the Bible, God says, go forward. I never see him saying, wait a minute, guys, pull up stakes, turn around, retreat. Crawl, you know, crawl in a hole somewhere and curl up in a ball. Uh, he, he, he never says retreat. We give up too easily, don't we? Yeah. You know, you don't know what's on the other side of the hill. You give up too soon. They, as we're talking, I'm just, I'm mindful. We have the privilege of doing st- uh, staff meetings and Bible studies together um, on days that we record. And we were looking at Luke chapter 21. Uh, today and, and Jesus is is speaking to his followers and he's being very honest with them. He's he's saying things are going to be tough, which I appreciate. I appreciate that kind of honesty. Uh, he says he says they will lay hands on you and persecute you, handing you over to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be an opportunity for you to bear testimony. So, wow. it, no no matter what happens, we still have the opportunity to bear testimony. And we're bearing testimony to who Christ is, and as he said in the Great Commission, all things that he has taught us. And we know that all things are are under his his authority. So that means we need to bear testimony of him in all things. Alan, it also goes on to say to, that we are, in verse 14, we're to make up our mind beforehand, ahead of time, not to worry about how we would defend ourselves, because he would give us the words and wisdom that none of the adversaries would be able to resist or contradict. That to me, that is encouraging us to stay engaged and try not to be anxious about our engagement, because he's, he, he will walk with us through that. Um, yes. every, every, and that's what is consistent throughout Scripture, when Jesus uh, imp- is encouraging us to stay the course, to finish the race. He, he always comes alongside and says, and I'm with you. I'm, we're we're going to be in this together. For me, it's not about we're losing the culture. I think as individuals, we have to focus on our immediate family, geography, sphere of influence, our networks that we have to see what we can do with what we've got. Now, I, I, but I, I need to challenge that, Melanie, in this regard. Okay. 
because we are so accustomed in America to looking at voting and the voting outcomes. In essence, forgive me, the, the idea that you're presenting, we, we presented the idea of let's jump to the kingdom of heaven and escape, or let's forsake the kingdom of earth because we've got to jump to heaven, or we could build little cultic hovels on earth and simply worry about ourselves and our own stuff, but that's still the world around us. I mean, eventually, as the world around us collapses, they're coming for us anyhow, is is, is what people right. are saying. Right, and I'm not there's, saying there's, try to... I'm not saying try to build a bubble around yourself or create some kind of occultic hubble. I'm saying do what you can with what you have, where you can have the influence with your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors. You know, that's the, the one-on-one sharing that Christ wants us to do. Well, if we're in this passage still, even that's not always going to go well. You will be, Christ says, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, kinsmen, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. So, even in our own spheres of influence, it may not go well. Uh, but, like to your point, Melanie, Christ is with us, and and there will always be people who would who will surprise us um, that they want to join Christ, that they want to join that family. He's he's always calling people to himself, right? And instead of re- as to Jeff's point, instead of saying retreat when you see the opportunity, he says to stand firm. Yes. So let's take a look at American history and world history. I'm not sure that other than, Jeff, you gave us 536, 536, was it? I believe, is what many—I said most earlier, but many historians say it was the worst year and then in the 6,000 years of, of yeah. human history. And then the 14th century, the, the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going to nominate the end of the 20th century as the next worst period, Wow, uh, yeah, particularly the end of World War II. And, and, and the regimes that followed. Can you mm-hmm. imagine what Christians in Germany would mm-hmm. have felt like the day after the war was over? Mm. Can you imagine? Mm-hmm. And, and, now, and I, I have a testimony of how they felt because our dear friend, Dr. John Parshower, was just a little boy at mm-hmm. that time. And he and his family, his mom and his dad, were missionaries to Germany. And they were in Germany the years that followed the war. And what mm-hmm. they would do is they would walk through the bombed out cities as, as, as a family with their guitars and their harmonica, and they would stand in the street and sing Christian hymns. Mm-hmm. And they would watch the people come out from the bombed out underground basements of all that was left of their homes. They would crawl out of those hovels that were left and stand in the street and weep and sing those hymns with them. In other words, at the end of the world, in our world, his world still goes on. I think what I'm trying to say is that so often when we're giving up hope, we're forgetting that there's someone else who cares about all of this more than we do. Mm -hmm. And we have a testimony of his integrity. He never gives up on his goal to see righteousness, justice, and kindness on earth. No matter how badly we mess it up, and could we have ever messed it up worse than we did at the end of the World War, World War II? At least, I mean, the people of Europe, could it have ever been any worse? But God was still there. Hmm. Well, we need to take a break. And uh, the clock dictates that, but we've got more to say. We have that uh, C.S. Lewis piece coming up as well. So you stick with us on the public square. Back on the public square, let's turn to Alan, our producer, who's also at the microphone for each program. Alan, well, I was I was thinking during the break after after Dave uh, talked about um, God's world. You know, we're talking about whose world is this, and, and uh, it makes me think of my my favorite hymn, "This Is My Father's World." Oh uh, yes, one of my, right. 
One of my favorite uh, stanzas of that says this, this is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, beautiful. I just think that's a beautiful um, thing to think about when we feel that that this world is not shaping up to how it should be. Does, doesn't it also say in that hymn, the battle is not done? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Isn't that a line in there somewhere? Yes, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also had a nominee for worst year ever, and it would have <laughs> to be the, <laughs> the, the year uh, directly before God decided to flood the earth. That would have probably been a pretty bad year to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> cause him to hit reset. Didn't think of yes. that. Um, so that's a bad one, too. So we got well, a lot of contenders. You always though. think outside the box, <laughs> don't you? And yet, and yet, things still, it was still his world. He's, it's still going to go on. So I don't know. It, to me, you should pretend like you're in a movie when everything seems darkest in the movie. That's when something really cool happens, you know, in any movie you like. So maybe we're in a tough part of the movie, but, but it's about to pick up. Well, the only constant in all of this is the Lord and his sovereignty. He's the only con constant. Our circumstances, our surroundings are always changing for the good or for the bad. But he is the constant. I don't think we can lose sight of that. I think there's a critical point that we, as uh, the American Policy Roundtable, as a mission to America, as a group of people that are unified with our trustees and our board and, and with 44 years of experience, would bring to the table. And that's that in addition to not really remembering who we're working for and how much he cares about this world, we also forget what America is. We forget that America began as an agreement of people who are accepting the responsibility of self-government under the rule of law. Nobody gave Americans this nation. Americans dug this nation out of the dirt with their own hands. It's never been easy to be an American. It's always required hard work. It's always required personal responsibility. And when Christians decide that they're going to vacate the kingdom of earth, focus on the kingdom of heaven because they don't like the current designs or directions, and escape from that personal responsibility of loving their neighbor who happens to be all part of this country, then we are abdicating every vestige by which we could get real change to happen. In other words, to make this as simple as possible, the simplest parable possible, if we all vacate the responsibility of what's happening in public education, who will decide what's happening in public education? Right. People who don't believe that God owns everything, right? People who believe that children are not a gift from the Lord, the children are not the custodial responsibility of their parents, people who believe in another set of principles, and they're just fine and happy to decide that the community will parent the children. The community of their circumstances will determine what history is. The community will decide whether or not you can read the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States or anything else in a public school classroom. If we're not on the school board, if we're not in the classroom, if we're not doing our jobs as moms and dads at home, then isn't somebody else going to raise our children? That's very true. And it's been true. We've been seeing the evidence of that for quite a while. So I, I think the hope is, is for us to stay focused, um, for us to keep our focus on Christ, but with our hearts also focused on the world around us. See, it used to be, Melanie, that we were trying to, to, to persuade people to give up the prosperity of America and the conveniences and distractions of America and serve their country as a form of love of neighbor. And it might mean you have to lose the bowling league. <laughs> you know, it might mean that Johnny and Sally and Susie have one less set of lessons to drive to. 
uh, for you to drive them to every week and you do something like be a part of the PTA or part of the local school board or run for city council or support someone who's in the state legislature, that you would get involved. And it was a question of convenience versus inconvenience. Now it's reached the place with many people. It's a theological question. They've reached the point of saying, what's the use? Don't, I'm not going to get involved anymore because it's too far gone. It, it, it doesn't matter anymore. I can't ever change things. Well, that is the most self-defeating, self-fulfilling prophecy you could ever extend. We got in this mess because we checked out. Mm-hmm. Now we're saying we're going to have to further check out. <laughs> I mean, it's like a comedy routine. Well, well like, exactly. Like, I mean, well, who's the coward here? Yeah. And we didn't get into the mess overnight. So we're not getting out of the mess overnight. I think that that we live in a culture and a society where we want instant gratification. We want to yeah. snap our fingers yeah. and have it at our fingertips and it be done and complete. It doesn't work that way. Like one one election cycle, that don't take care of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> we could do, and it, and we have, we've done a program, we've done programs in our inventory on the concept of the remnant. I mean, mm-hmm. th- this is a very real biblical concept, and it's a very real historical concept as well. You know, Dave, you know how important the, the arts are uh, to, to all of us here, but Christians in large part abandoned the arts for a generation. Now you can't turn on a cartoon for kids without some agenda being fed to them. Mm-hmm. We abandoned academia in many places, and now schools that were started by Christians generations ago just peddle the latest fads. Uh, we abandoned architecture even for, for a generation, and now the faith that built Gothic cathedrals makes boxes with big parking lots. Uh, <laughs> we, we used to build yeah. hospitals that were named Saint Somebody, and now we seeded that ground to insurance companies, pharmaceutical reps, and bureaucrats. So to your point, how, how much further do we want to check out? This all took place over a generation, and so we need to get re-engage. And I have to tell you, this is where I am tempted to sin, and probably I do. When people come to me with escapism, I want to say to them, excuse me, what do you have the right to escape from? <laughs> what have you invested to stop this from happening, that suddenly you're going to justify running away further based on your religion, based on your God, based on your, uh, your, your thought? Can you show me where Jesus is telling you it's time to go? And the only thing they can point to is, well, he said, my kingdom is not of this earth. We're citizens of the eternal kingdom. There's not, we, we're not going to be able to turn it around. So, oh, well, it, it's, it's just, it, it's sad. I, I feel bad. And, and I look back and I think to myself, could I look at your checkbook the last 30 years? Mm-hmm. Could I see your calendar? Could we judge our lives based upon what we could have done that we didn't do that would have saved lives? And then here's the really scary thing. I mean, I know we're all saved by grace, through faith, through Christ alone. I get it. But do you think anywhere our master who told us occupy until I come is going to ask to look at those same things when we meet him face to face? Well, uh, you can tell by our silence that something profound was just said. I tell you what, we'll come back on the public square on most of these stations, on nearly all these stations. A few must cut away now, but if you have to leave us, don't forget, go online to thepublicsquare.com to hear the remainder of this program, which is next, The Public Square. Lest we neglect it, we promised some C.S. Lewis here today. And uh, Dave, we don't have much time left, so let's get after it. Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says this, Hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, 
the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Powerful. Dave, I saw a practical example of this a few months ago in Korea. The South Koreans never pray without praying for reunification, for praying that they will be made whole again with their brothers to the north, that communist country. And I took great uh, comfort in the fact that they have that hope and they, they believe it so strongly. They, they pray about it continually. And more than that, they're working to that end because they, are, they already have infrastructure plans laid out, developed for developing North Korea once that happens. And that, that spoke very loudly to me. That's a great example. Jeff, you had a story also that I think we wanted to talk about today. You mentioned it in staff. Yeah, a long time ago when I was a young man, it was, it was December of 1983, and I went with Campus Crusade to this thing called KC83, Kansas City. And uh, Chuck Swindoll spoke and Billy Graham spoke and blah, blah, blah. And best speech I, I've ever heard in my whole life was by Elizabeth Elliott. And she stood up in front of, it must have been 20,000 college students. And she talked about the things that we value in life, the things that are important, and how do you measure, how do you measure success? What is success in God's economy? And at the end, she, she thundered. She said, you have to go out. You don't have to come back. Oh. And then she said it again, you have to go out. You don't have to come back. And, and, you know, here's the woman who lost her husband, and then she and her little three-year-old daughter and, and another lady went into the jungle to convert the people who had murdered their husbands, you know. And so she had all kinds of credibility. And her point was, God never tells us to retreat. You, you've got to go out and do what God says and don't lose hope and don't say— you know, this is measured by my American standards of success and it has to be done today. Go out and do what God tells you to do and leave the results to him. Uh, we have hangings all over the walls at the American Mission Center. We have notes in our Bibles. We have things that we carry with us called Great Commission Cards. And I firmly believe that the work that we do here is anchored in the Great Commission. If we read the Great Commission in its totality and don't cut it short, uh, Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. It begins with the reality that the risen Christ stood in front of his followers and said, Let me make something very clear. All authority, that includes every person right now who is illegitimately behaving in a position of authority everywhere in the world. It means everyone who's doing a great job in authority everywhere in the world. It means every authority that has ever existed or ever will exist. All things, all things, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. Not will be given unto me, have been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've taught you. And lo, I am with you all the days to the very end of days. That great commission is as applicable in this very second as it was when Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, spoke it on this earth. It's as legitimate and valid and his presence is as real and available as it was then. Now, take a look at the fact that he didn't have, by both counts, 500 people in on the deal of following him into all the world at the moment he spoke it. And look at what's happened since. How in the world can we, of all people in America, and yes, this is a blatant evangelical guilt trip, Huh. <laughs> if, if, if Jesus Christ could make that statement as he did with 500 people maximum listening, 
a, a part of it. And there may have only been 11 or 12 there for all we know. And they could bring us to where we are today in that tradition of faith. How do we escape? How do we escape so great a salvation, so great a commission, so great an opportunity? Where are we going to run to? Because when we run to it, guess what we're going to find? We're going to find him. You know what he's going to say? Turn around. Go back. <laughs> and go back. You don't have to return. <laughs> when I read the Great Commission, you know, it, go, as we've mentioned multiple times in this segment, but it reassures me the fact that there is some responsibility on my part in that individual relationship with Christ. He may tell me to go one place. We may tell my neighbor to go another place. He may tell someone else to go somewhere else. He's going to give us all specific individual instructions on how to live that Great Commission out. I think my favorite part is the fact that he, there's no abandonment on his part. He wants us to go and do, but he is glued to us in that process. He promises to guide us. He promises to stay with us. He promises in some portions of Scripture to even give us the words to say. So, you know, what excuse do we have to not go? I mean, we have the God of the universe walking right there with us. I, I think that I find a lot of hope in that. And he is not without a witness. Let's turn just for the close of this conversation to the, to the question of the Tower of Babel. Hmm. Right? The bad guys decided they were going to build a tower to the heavens because they had this thing figured out. And, you know, that tower fell under its own weight. <laughs> now, you might say God might have caused a little breeze to come by and push a <laughs> smidge, but it, it, was, it was coming down one way or the other. I have Jenga in my mind right now, the game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so many morals in this story, but there's one thing you can understand looking back at history. God who owns this place has already told us he will never ultimately let evil prevail or triumph over good. Mm -hmm. Our calling is to overcome evil by doing good. Mm -hmm. Think of the people at the end of World War II, throughout World War II, in Poland, in Germany, in France, who resisted the Nazis. Think of the Poles who resisted the Soviet Union for 70 years. Think of Pope John Paul II, who his entire life faced down the Nazis and then faced down the communists and how long it took and how many people died and gave their lives. And they were enslaved and they, and they were never a majority. It was never going the right direction. They were always being steamrolled over and they never gave up in their resistance. And then what happened? The tower fell. For all of us who lived during that time, we never expected the Soviet Union That's to true. collapse, yeah. did we? We, we never thought the Berlin Wall would come down. When it happened, I looked at my wife and I said, is this a trick? <laughs> so when people tell me, oh, we're too far gone, oh, it'll never happen, blah, 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 blah. Look back in history at all the times people have said, oh, it'll never happen, I'll never live to see the day, and then the day came. With God, all things are possible. Dave, whatever reluctance mm -hmm. you had to bring this topic up, I think our listeners are saying thank you right now for bringing this topic to us today, so thank you. And thank you for listening to The Public Square. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.